Hello dear students, welcome to the lecture 10 of security of information systems. Uh, so the today's topic is communication security. Okay, let's start. So the outline of this uh, lecture is network co security concepts, uh, communication security, perimeter security, protocol architecture and security services, example security protocols, uh, transport layer security, TSL, IP layer security, IPsec, uh, VPN virtual private network. Okay, so network security concepts assume that each organization owns a network Wants to protect own local network wants to protect communication with other networks So that uh, so network security two many main areas there are communication security Protection of data transmitted across networks between organizations and end users so this is a topic for this lecture and there is perimeter security. Let's read it. Perimeter security, protection of an organization's network from unauthorized access. Okay, and this is the topic for next lecture. Uh, so uh, the uh, TSL is what we know uh, as HTTPS. We will see that. Okay. So the communication architecture. Okay, let's uh, uh, analyze this. There is service layer protocol. French oceanographer. Oceanographer, what is this? Okay. And there is translation service. Uh, translator. Encode, Morse code, radio operator. Okay, communication architecture. Encode and transmit. Okay, let's say French oceanographer and Italian oceanographer wants to communicate. Okay, and so they they use uh, translator service. Uh, to use translator service, uh, first uh, uh, the whatever the text being sent is being encoded, then getting uh, transmitted. I think this is related to somewhat um, word word one or two transmitted to be by radio operator. Then it is more uh, decoded and translated and sent to the Italian oceanographer. Okay, let's continue. Communication protocol architecture. Layered structure of hardware and software that supports the exchange of data between systems. Each protocol consists of a set of rules for exchanging messages, i.e. the protocol. So there are two standards of protocols, uh, OSI reference model. OSI reference model. Never live it up early promises. Oh, it seems like this was the very early, early model of communication. However, it was uh, abandoned. Let's see it. What was it? Okay. The Open Systems Interconnection Model (OSI) model is a conceptual model that characterizes and standardizes the communication functions of a telecommunication or computing system without regard to its underlying internal structure and technology. Its goal is the interoperability of diverse communication systems with standard communication protocols. So let's see the history. Okay, I think this is, uh, this is what we need. 
OSI was an industry effort, attempting to get industry participants to agree on common network standards to provide multi-vendor interoperability. 11. It was common for large networks to support multiple network protocol suites, with many devices unable to interoperate with other devices because of a lack of common protocols. For a period in the late 1980s and early 1990s, engineers, organizations and nations became polarized over the issue of which standard, the OSI model or the Internet Protocol Suite, would result in the best and most robust computer networks. 4, 12, 13. However, while OSI developed its networking standards in the late 1980s, 14, 15, TCP, IP came into widespread use on multi-vendor networks for internetworking. The OSI model is still used as a reference for teaching and documentation. 16. However, the OSI protocols originally conceived for the model did not gain popularity. Okay. Some engineers argue the OSI reference model is still relevant to cloud computing. 17. Others say the original OSI model doesn't fit today's networking protocols and have suggested instead a simplified approach. 18. Okay, so we now. Uh, know about OSI model which was never get popular to use it and the TCP IP protocol site which we are still using it is most widely used one of course so OSI open system interconnection developed by the International Organization for Standardization ISO Okay, a layer model of seven layers each layer performs a subset of required communication functions each layer re relies on the next lower layer to perform more primitive functions. Each layer provides services to next higher layer. Changes in one layer should not require changes in other layers. Okay, so the OSI protocol stack is like this. The most uh, deepest layer is physical, physical layer. Then there is data link layer. Then there is network layer. Then there is transport layer. Then uh, the software starts, session layer, presentation and application. I think for first uh, four layers are uh, more like um, hardware related and the last three are software, we will see that. Okay, communication across OCI. Uh, there is bit stream in the layer, uh, in the first layer. There is data being sent, sent with a uh, data header probably okay tail and this is not good e example okay let's see this device a intermediate node intermediate node device b okay so this is more explanative there is physical communication with which is wired uh, communication then there is data link and there is network and the transport starts layer to layer communication then session presentation and application maybe we can find something um, better example okay Okay, physical, move data between devices, data link, prepare data for transmission, network, provide logical addressing, transport, break, break data stream in smaller segments and provide reliable and unreliable data delivery. So these are the bottom layers. Uh, session, initiate and terminate session with remote system, presentation, encrypt, format and compress data for transmission, application, provide user interface to send and receive the data. Okay. So it is like this, top and bottom, and there are each layer in details. Okay, let's read it. Um, or maybe we should read more about TCP IP. Okay, I think I will read more about TCP IP. TCP IP protocol architecture.
developed by the U.S. Defense Advanced Research Project Agency DARPA, for its packet-switched network ARPANET. Used by global internet, by the global internet, no official model, but it is a working one. Application layer, host host transport layer, internet layer, network access layer, and physical layer. So the OCI model versus TCP IP model, the internet. What is the difference? Physical layers are same. Data link and network layer is uh, split as network access and internet in the IP protocol and the other layers are intermixed transport layer transport host host session application presentation and application application protocols are such as http ftf ftf how does this ftp ftp ms smmtp and snmp okay and tcp is transmission control protocol udp is user datagram protocol and ip internet protocol TCP IP model, example access over Wi Fi router, HTTP, TCP, IP, Wi Fi, and Wi Fi, Ethernet, Ethernet. Okay. So this is how it is done. And communication security analogy is like this. Physical transport security is like an um, armored vehicle transporting money to a bank from. Uh, uh, let's say school and it is equivalent on internet is from school computer you are connecting to bank server with proper protected pipe okay digital communication security is like this okay before delving into security protocols let's see how does tcp ip works Okay, let's try to find a good example for this one. Okay, let's read this. Let's see who has posted this. Uh, article I think I will read the Avast definition, you know Avast is um, an antivirus software. What is TCP IP and how does it work? Just like people, it's important for computers to have a common way to communicate with each other. Today most computers do this through TCP IP. TCP IP is typically built into computers and is largely automated, but it can be useful to understand the TCP IP model, particularly when you're setting up a computer to connect with other systems. This article explains how TCP IP works. Okay, use the Ethernet adapter server connection specific DNS suffix, IP address subnet mask, default gateway. When you type IP config, uh, you will see this information. I mean, uh, run your uh, command probe and type IP config, you will see uh, your network properties. Okay. What does TCP IP stand for? TCP IP stands for Transmission Control Protocol Internet Protocol. TCP IP is a set of standardized rules that allow computers to communicate on a network such as the internet. Okay. By itself, an individual computer can perform any number of jobs. But computers' real power shines when they communicate with each other.
Many of the things we think about computers doing, whether it's sending email messages, watching Netflix, or getting directions, involve computers communicating. These computers may be from different companies, or even located in different parts of the world, and the people and programs using them may use different human and computer languages. Okay. Any given interaction may be between two computer systems, or it may involve hundreds of systems. But, like passing a letter or a package from hand to hand, each transaction occurs between just two computers at a time. For this to happen, the two computers need to know, ahead of time, how they are expected to communicate. How do they start the conversation? Whose turn is it to communicate? How does each computer know its message was transmitted correctly? How do they end the conversation? Okay, these are the uh, most basic questions uh, when we are communicating between computers, okay? Computers do this through protocols. A protocol is an agreed-upon set of rules. In human terms, we use social protocols to know how to behave and communicate with other people. Technologies have their own ways of setting communication rules, such as the telegraph using Morse code or a CB radio using codes like 10 to 4. Okay. It's the same thing with computers, but with more hard and fast rules. When computers all use the same protocol, information can be transferred. When they don't, it's chaos. Communication was more complicated when people first started to exchange information between computers. Each vendor had its own way of communicating between its own computers, but that didn't enable communication with other vendors' computers. It soon became clear that an agreed-upon standard was needed that permitted computers from all vendors to communicate with each other. And that standard is TCP IP. How do TCP and IP differ? TCP and IP are two separate computer network protocols. IP is the part that obtains the address to which data is sent. TCP is responsible for data delivery once that IP address has been found. You see, IP is the location of uh, the uh, target computer and TCP is the uh, protocol that is ens ens ensuring that your data has been sent correctly okay so it is about this one is about delivery and this was is, is about uh, address okay it's possible to separate them but there isn't really a point in making a difference between TCP and IP because they're so often used together, TCP, IP, and the TCP, IP model are now recognized terminology. Okay. Think of it this way, the IP address is like the phone number assigned to your smartphone. TCP is all the technology that makes the phone ring, and that enables you to talk to someone on another phone. They are different from one another, but they are also meaningless without one another. What does TCP IP do exactly and how does it work? Okay. TCP IP was developed by the US Department of Defense to specify how computers transfer data from one device to another. TCP IP puts a lot of emphasis on accuracy and it has several steps to ensure that data is correctly transmitted between the two computers. Here's one way it does that. If the system were to send the whole message in one piece and if it were to encounter a problem, the whole message would have to be resent. Instead, TCP IP breaks each message into packets and those packets are then reassembled on the other end. In fact, each packet could take a different route to the other computer, if the first route is unavailable or congested. Okay. By the way, uh, US 
Department of Defense has developed so many technologies that we use today. You will be shocked how many uh, technologies were um, developed by the uh, U.S. Defense Department. Okay. Anyway, you see, uh, TCP/IP was developed by uh, U.S. Department of Defense. In addition, TCP IP divides the different communications tasks into layers. Each layer has a different function. Data goes through four individual layers before it is received on the other end, as explained in the following section. TCP IP then goes through these layers in reverse order to reassemble the data and to present it to the recipient. The purpose of the layers is to keep things standardized, without numerous hardware and software vendors having to manage communication on their own. It's like driving a car, all the manufacturers agree on where the pedals are, so that's something we can count on between cars. It also means that certain layers can be updated, such as to improve performance or security, without having to upgrade the entire thing. Okay, it is like you are sending pieces from one computer to another one and pieces uh, at the destination is then uh, merged again. The four layers of the TCP IP model TCP IP is a data link protocol that is used on the internet. Its model is split into four distinct layers. Okay. used together they can also be referred to as a suite of protocols okay so there are four um, distinct layers first one is data link layer the data link layer also called the link layer network interface layer or physical layer is what handles the physical parts of sending and receiving data using the ethernet cable wireless network network interface card device driver in the computer and so on so this is the lowest layer. Then there is internet layer. The internet layer, also called the network layer, controls the movement of packets around the network. Sometimes uh, when you check your uh, home internet modem, you see that uh, IP layer is uh, offline. I mean the uh, uh, data link layer is online and internet layer is offline. That is why they are actually separate layers. Because data, data link layer is about uh, physical uh, transportation and internet layer is about addressing uh, the, uh, let's say, computers, devices and such. Then there is transport layer. The transport layer is what provides a reliable data connection between two devices. It divides the data in packets, acknowledges the packets that it has received from the other device, and makes sure that the other device acknowledges the packets it receives. Okay, so there is a dual handshake application layer. The application layer is the group of applications that require network communication. This is what the user typically interacts with, such as email and messaging. Because the lower layers handle the details of communication, the applications don't need to concern themselves with this. Okay. Are my data packets private? No. When the packets are being transmitted between computers, they are vulnerable to being seen by others. That's one reason why you are advised to avoid public Wi-Fi networks when sending data that must stay private, and to use encryption. If this is something you are concerned about, for example, if you're sending personally identifiable information or financial information, you can encrypt your data using a virtual private network VPN. A VPN is the best way to ensure your data is effectively encrypted and packets are protected as they travel between networks. You can set up a VPN manually, or better yet, try a vast secure line VPN. Okay, so they are making advertisement here. 
VPN is about uh, transferring your data over, not directly over your network. However, uh, using uh, a middle layer uh, server, uh, therefore you can encrypt your data between that middle layer server and uh, your uh, public network. And it is another encryption to do HTTPS protocol. Okay, it, it can be. Does TCP IP work with all types of IP address? There are several kinds of IP addresses, but whatever type of IP address you employ, it uses TCP IP. The differences between types of IP addressing are transparent to you as a casual user, and the fact that you don't need to know much about it is among TCP IP's strengths. Usually these matters are managed by whoever sets up your computer operating system or mobile device. But for clarity. Okay, one moment. Uh, there is some... Okay, this one. Not that one. Okay. Static IP addresses stay the same all the time. They are like the fixed address on your house, an unchanging address. Dynamic IP addresses change, or at least they are designed to change. When a computer system uses a dynamic IP address, it announces, this is where you can find me, to the local network, rather like the address of a hotel room, where the hotel knows how to find you. To learn more about this distinction, see static versus dynamic IP addresses. You may have heard of cities where the population is growing so quickly that they've had to create new area codes so new arrivals could get telephone numbers. With the ever-increasing number of connected devices, TCP IP had a similar problem, the internet was basically running out of IP addresses. So a new version of IP address called IPv6 was developed as an alternative to the existing IPv4 addresses. Here's a more in-depth look at the differences between IPv4 versus IPv6 addresses. Okay, so... Uh... Actually, this is more about the uh, topic of uh, network course. Uh, so I will just uh, end it here. So there are security protocols. Many different security protocols have been specified and implemented for different purposes, authentication, integrity, confidentiality, key establishment, exchange, e-voting, secret sharing, etc. Okay. Protocols are surprisingly difficult to get right. Many vulnerabilities are discovered years later, e.g. for TLS, Drown, Poodle, Robot, Logjam, Freak, Beast, some are never discovered or maybe only by the attackers. Security Protocols Overview this lecture discusses the operation of two network-related protocols that are in common use. Transport Layer Security TLS, used extensively on the web and is often referred to in privacy policies as a means of providing confidential web connections. IP Security IPSEC, provides security services at the IP level and is used to provide virtual private network VPN, services. Okay. So transport layer security TSL SSL. Okay. So this is uh, something you are using at your everyday TLS SSL everyday life. Um, all our connections uh, in the modern uh, websites, modern servers are encrypted. You see, my connection is secure. Okay. There are certificate cookies. Let's click the certificate and when you uh, click the details you can see the certificate details 
uh, certification pad and such okay so this is uh, HTTPS uh, with TSL SSL protocol so let's see the history quickly SSL TLS history 1994, Netscape Communications developed the Network Authentication Protocol Secure Sockets Layer, SSL v2. Badly broken. 1995, Netscape released their own improvements SSL v3. Widely used for many years. 1996, SSL v3 was submitted to the IETF as an internet draft, and an IETF working group was formed to develop a recommendation. By the way, you may be wondering what, uh, what is Netscape uh, Communications. Netscape Communications. Uh, Netscape was a web browser as far as I know. I have also never used it. Maybe I have used it, but I don't remember at the moment. Let's uh, get some idea about it. Netscape Communications Corporation, originally Mosaic Communications Corporation, was an independent American computer services company with headquarters in Mountain View, California and then Dulles, Virginia. Two, its Netscape web browser was once dominant but lost to Internet Explorer and other competitors in the so-called First Browser War, with its market share falling from more than 90% in the mid-1990s to less than 1% in 2006. Four, Netscape created Created the JavaScript programming language, the most widely used language for client-side scripting of web pages. The company also developed SSL which was used for securing online communications before its successor TLS took over. 5. So you see Netscape was a pioneer. Uh, they have developed SSL and JavaScript programming. Uh, so they were a pioneer uh, company. Uh, okay, let's continue. In January 1999, RFC 2246 was issued by the IETF, Transport Layer Security Protocol, TLS 1.0 similar to, but incompatible with SSL v3 currently TLS 1.2 allows backwards compatibility with SSL draft TLS 1.3 totally bans SSL Firefox browser enabled TLS 1.3 by default in February 2017. Okay, uh, latest TSL. So the latest one is let's see TSL 1.3. Okay. So this is the latest version. Let's read something about this. Transport Layer Security TLS, and its now deprecated predecessor, Secure Sockets Layer SSL, are cryptographic protocols designed to provide communication security over a computer network. Several versions of the protocols are widely used in applications such as web browsing, email, instant messaging, and voice over IP VoIP. Websites can use TLS to secure all communications between their servers and web browsers. The TLS protocol aims primarily to provide privacy and data integrity between two or more communicating computer applications. When secured by TLS, connections between a client e.g., a web browser, and a server e.g., wikipedia.org should have one or more of the following properties. The connection is private or secure because symmetric cryptography is used to encrypt the data transmitted. The keys for this symmetric encryption are generated uniquely for each connection and are based on a shared secret that was negotiated at the start of the session. The server and client negotiate the details of which encryption algorithm and cryptographic keys to use before the first byte of data is transmitted see below. 
The negotiation of a shared secret is both secure, the negotiated secret is unavailable to eavesdroppers and cannot be obtained, even by an attacker who places themselves in the middle of the connection, and reliable, no attacker can modify the communications during the negotiation without being detected. The identity of the communicating parties can be authenticated using public key cryptography. This authentication can be made optional, but is generally required for at least one of the parties, typically the server. The connection is reliable because each message transmitted includes a message integrity check using a message authentication code to prevent undetected loss or alteration of the data during transmission. One, three. Okay, and let's read this one. In addition to the properties above, careful configuration of TLS can provide additional privacy-related properties such as forward secrecy, ensuring that any future disclosure of encryption keys cannot be used to decrypt any TLS communications recorded in the past. TLS supports many different methods for exchanging keys, encrypting data, and authenticating message integrity, see below. As a result, secure configuration of TLS involves many configurable parameters, and not all choices provide all of the privacy-related properties described in the list above. See the section key exchange, authentication, section cipher security, and section data integrity tables. Attempts have been made to subvert aspects of the communications security that TLS seeks to provide, and the protocol has been revised several times to address these security threats. Developers of web browsers have repeatedly revised their products to defend against potential security weaknesses after these were discovered CTLS, SSL support history of web browsers. The TLS protocol comprises two layers, the TLS record and the TLS handshake protocols. TLS is a proposed Internet Engineering Task Force IETF, first defined in 1999, and the current version is TLS 1.3 defined in August 2018. TLS builds on the earlier SSL specifications 1994, 1995, 1996 developed by Netscape Communications for adding the HTTPS protocol to their Navigator web browser. Okay, and so you see I, I, IATF, this is also uh, really important for you to know. Uh, let's get some information related to IATF on Wikipedia. Internet Engineering Task Force The Internet Engineering Task Force IETF, is an open standards organization, which develops and promotes voluntary Internet standards, in particular the standards that comprise the Internet Protocol Suite TCP, IP, too, it has no formal membership roster or membership requirements. All participants and managers are volunteers, though their work is usually funded by their employers or sponsors. The IETF started out as an activity supported by the federal government of the United States, but since 1993 it has operated as a standards development function under the auspices of the Internet Society, an international membership-based non-profit organization. Okay, so now you know it. There are RCP codes in uh, IET, IATF. Let's search for this, for example. You see, uh, on their website, you can find all the RCP codes. Uh, they they are usually uh, documented like this. You can read about them. Uh, you can see their updated version. What are they about, and such. So everyone can contribute. You see, there are updates to this one. For example, the latest one is this. Seventy nine nineteen and such you can see the uh, authors and such okay so the versions are like this tls overview
TLS is a cryptographic services protocol based on the browser PKI and is commonly used on the internet. Each server has a server certificate and private key installed, allows browsers to establish secure sessions with web servers. Port 443 is reserved for HTTP over TLS, SSL and the protocol HTTPS is used with this port. HTTP colon slash slash www.xxx.com implies using standard HTTP using port 80, HTTPS colon slash slash www.xxx.com implies HTTP over TLS, SSL with port 443, other applications, IMAP over TLS, port 993 POP3 over TLS, port 995. Okay, IMAP is for emails, I, as far as I know. And POP is also about emails. You may look up, up uh, about them if you wonder. So TLS, layer 4 security. And you see when we compare OC, uh, OSI model and TCP IP layers, uh, the TLS operates at the layer 4 transport layer and host host transport layer. So it is used when the data is being sent uh, to the target computer. Okay. So the protocol stack of TLS is first there is handshake protocol and with that way they agree on some uh, keys. Then TLS changed cipher side protocol, TLS alert protocol, application protocol, record protocol, TCP, IP. So these are separate protocols, separate layers, and this is the in the same layer. TLS architecture overview. Designed to provide secure, reliable end-to-end -end services over TCP consists of three higher level protocols tls handshake protocol tls alert protocol tls change cipher spec protocol the tls record protocol provides the practical encryption and integrity services to various application protocols okay TLS, Handshake Protocol 23, the Handshake Protocol, negotiates the encryption to be used, establishes a shared session key, authenticates the server, authenticates the client optional, completes the session establishment, after the handshake, application data is transmitted securely, several variations of the handshake exist, RSA variants, Diffie-Hellman variants. Okay. So this is about handshake. In the handshake, you see uh, first negotiations and agreements are made. Then the uh, data transfer can uh, start. TLS, Handshake 4 Phases, Phase 1, initiates the logical connection and establishes its security capabilities, Phases 2 and 3, performs key exchange. The messages and message content used in this phase depends on the handshake variant negotiated in Phase 1. Phase 4, completes the setting up of a secure connection. Okay, so you see client says hello at the Phase 1 to the server. Uh, whenever we connect to a server, first it starts with this way, and then server says us uh, hello, then uh, server sends us server certificate, then server key exchange and certificate request, and server is done. Okay, so you see, after we, our browser or the, our software that uses a HTTP uh, protocol, uh, with HTTPS protocol, First says hello to the server, then expects five uh, messages which are server hello, server certificate, server key exchange, certificate request and server is then done. You see server also sends I am done message. 
Then we uh, use client certificate. Then we send our client certificate, client key exchange, and certificate verify. And there are uh, change cipher specification and finished. Then once all these uh, agreements are done, uh, we can uh, start uh, transmitting data uh, between client and server with uh, uh, encryption. TLS, simplified RSA based handshake. Okay, there is client. Uh, supported crypto algorithms and protocol versions, client hello, and server. Uh, you see, when we make a request, uh, we, can, we also define the what protocols and what we are uh, supporting. Uh, let's, for example, open Wikipedia. Not this one. Let's open network. Okay. So here, uh, our first uh, initial, in, initialization of a request, when uh, we check the details, let's check the details um, by here. Okay. You see general. Okay. And response headers request okay first our browser makes a request so in our request we use a method get and authority to this domain and the path to this page and the scheme you see is https okay i am requesting uh, the page over https protocol then i define what methods i accept our browser uh, we accept uh, text HTML, XHTML, XML, application XML, image, uh, web image, AP, APG, and, and uh, some signed exchange, uh, Q protocol, and such. And which encodings I accept, I define it. I, I, uh, our browser accepts uh, GZIP, deflate, and BR. These are heavily reduces, these heavily reduces the uh, data being transferred because the data is usual if the remote server is supporting uh, data is transmitted with uh, uh, um, what is it uh, followed as zipping or running uh, okay so I can't remember the term to use it. And okay, compressing. So with these methods, uh, the messages are compressed and sent, and then they are uh, decrypted, decompressed, and I send. Uh, uh, language then cookies and such then we get the response uh, headers we can see the response headers you see accept range bytes the age of page that they should be valid and some other things uh, date last modified and some other parameters Okay, server type, server timing. Okay. Okay, anyway. Uh, let's continue. Uh, then server says hello and common protocol, common algorithm server certificate are sent back. Then secret material encrypted with server public key is sent to the server, client key exchange. Client and server generalization key from secret material. And then go to crypto with common algorithm and session key, change cipher swipe, go to crypto with common algorithm and session key, change cipher swipe, and continuous with TS, TLS, record protocol, encrypted with session key. We have already seen this in previous lectures.
TLS, Elements of Handshake 26, Client Hello, Advertises Available Algorithms e.g. RSA, AES, SHA-256 Different Types of Algorithms Bundled into, Cypher Suites, Format, TLS underscore key exchange algorithm underscore with underscore data protection algorithm, example, TLS underscore RSA underscore with underscore AES underscore 256 underscore CBC underscore SHA 256, RSA for key exchange, AES with CBC mode for encryption, SHA 256 as hash function for authentication and integrity protection, server hello, returns the selected cipher suite server adapts to client capabilities okay tls elements of handshake 27 server certificate by 0.509 digital certificate sent to client client verifies the certificate including that the certificate signer is in its acceptable certificate authority ca list now the client has the server's certified public key Client certificate, optionally, the client can send its BY.509 certificate to server, in order to provide mutual authentication, server, client key exchange, the client and server can establish session key using asymmetric encryption or DH key exchange, details below. TLS, Record Protocol Overview 28, provides two services for SSL connections. Message confidentiality, ensure that the message contents cannot be read in transit. The handshake protocol establishes a symmetric key used to encrypt SSL payloads. Okay. Message integrity, ensure that the receiver can detect if a message is modified in transmission. The handshake protocol establishes a shared secret key used to construct a MAC. Okay. TLS, Record Protocol Operation 29, Fragmentation, each application layer message is fragmented into blocks of 214 bytes or less. Compression, optionally applied. SSLv3 and TLS, default compression algorithm is null. However, uh, usually, Base it on your application if it is support and if the server supports GZIP or other uh, deflate uh, compression algorithms are used and they heavily reduces the, uh, the data that has to be transferred. Okay, they are really good. Add MAC calculates a MAC over the compressed data using a MAC secret from the connection state. Encrypt compressed data plus MAC are encrypted with symmetric cipher. Permitted ciphers include AES, IDEA, DAY, 3DES, RC4 for block ciphers, padding is applied after the MAC to make a multiple of the cipher's block size. TLS, Key Exchange 30, two possibilities for exchange of secret key material, premaster secret, PS, RSA encryption, DH exchange, RSA encryption, client generates PS plus encrypts PS with server public key, RSA, server decrypts PS with server private key, RSA. Okay, illustration of the H, uh, key exchange, Alice, Bob, common pins, secret colors and public transport assume that mixture separation is expensive secret colors and common secret is generated we have seen details of this in previous lectures diffie hellman key exchange process alice and bob agree on public parameters large prime number p all calculation are performed mod p generator g ie g is primitive root mod p alice chooses random number a, one less than a less than p1 and sends ga to bob bod chooses random number b one less than b less than p1 and send gb to alice common secret k equals ga b mod p equals gb a mod p equals ga Gab mod p security k cannot be calculated from ga o r g b weakness of dh key exchange 
Okay, secure communications. The weakness is if uh, your used numbers are uh, double to compute in a strong uh, machine, that is weakness, therefore you have to use longer keys. TLS, key exchange 34, two possibilities for exchange of secret key material, premaster secret, PS, RSA encryption, DH exchange, RSA encryption, client generates PS plus encrypts PS with server public key, RSA, server decrypts PS with server private key, RSA, DH exchange, client and server perform Diffie-Hellman exchange, DH, server signs his DH value with his private key, RSA, client Client validates signature with server public key RSA. TLS key exchange 35 problem with RSA key exchange. Let's assume adversary records complete TLS session. If later private key of server is known, premaster secret can be decrypted, session key can be calculated, complete payload can be decrypted with DH exchange. Later knowledge of private key is useless. Payload remains protected. Perfect forward secrecy. Okay. TLS, symmetric key derivation, using two random numbers from client and server plus premaster secret, key material calculation, general uses, key expansion, internally using a pseudo-random function based on hash function can produce arbitrary length key material, master secret calculation, input, premaster secret, random number client, random number server, output, master secret, 48 byte, encryption, MAC key calculation, input, master secret, secret, random number client, random number server, output, key block, is partitioned into required keys. Okay. SSL, TLS challenges 37, higher layers should not be overly reliant on SSL, TLS. Many vulnerabilities exist for SSL, TLS. People are easily tricked, changing between HTTP and HTTPS causes vulnerability to SSL stripping attacks, SSL, TLS only is secure as the cryptographic algorithms used in handshake protocol, hashing, symmetric and asymmetric crypto. Relies on browser PKI which has many security issues, fake server certificates difficult to detect, fake root server certificates can be embedded in platform, CEG Lenovo Commodia Adver scam. Let's see, this, well, what is this? Uh, by the way, uh, when I click here, you see my certificate is being uh, verified by the Kaspersky Antivirus uh, Personal Root Certificate. So Kaspersky overrides uh, and checks uh, the certificate is valid or not. Uh, therefore, uh, prevents uh, hackers to change certificate in my computer. Okay, so it is called a superfish, I think. I believe I have read this uh, previously. Superfish was an advertising company that developed various advertising supported software products based on a visual search engine. The company was based in Palo Alto, California, 1. It was founded in Israel in 2006, 2. And has been regarded as part of the country's Download Valley cluster of adware companies, 3. Superfish's software has been described as malware or adware by many sources, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The software was bundled with various applications as early as 2010, and Lenovo began to bundle the software with some of its computers in September 2014. 4. On February 20, 2015, the United States Department of Homeland Security advised uninstalling it and its associated root certificate because they make computers vulnerable to serious cyber attacks, including interception of passwords and sensitive data being transmitted through browsers. Okay. Okay, you can read its history if you want. SSL stripping attack. SSL stripping attack.
Okay, you see, uh, when we do HTTP access, man in middle, and HTTP access, uh, then redirect SSL. Okay, uh, so servers usually redirect you to SSL version of uh, that requested page, and okay. However, if there is a man in middle. Uh, they fake your HTTP access and therefore uh, sends you back the HTTP login page and then when you provide credit intels, uh, they get your credit intels. There are some variations. Variations include, MyTM server can connect to client over HTTPS in MSG 6 with server certificate that has similar domain name as real server. Attacker can leave the connection after stealing credentials, then the client connects directly to real server with HTTPS, attacker just downgrades the HTTPS connection to a vulnerable SSL, TLS version or a broken cipher suite. So this is a... Uh... M I T M is man in the middle. HSTS HTTP strict transport security preventing SSL stripping. A secure server can instruct browsers to only use HTTPS when requesting website that uses HSTS. The browser automatically forces connect with HTTPS. Users are not able to override policy. Two ways of specifying HSTS websites. List of HSTS websites can be preloaded into browsers. HSTS policy initially specified over a HTTPS connection. HSTS policy can be changed over a HTTPS connection. Disadvantages. HSTS websites can not use both HTTP and HTTPS. Difficult for a website to stop using HTTPS. Can cause denial of service, e.g. no fallback to HTTPS. HTTP in case of expired server certificate. Okay, so you are wondering what is HSTS? HTTP Strict Transport Security HSTS, is a web security policy mechanism that helps to protect websites against man-in-the-middle attacks such as protocol downgrade attacks one, and cookie hijacking. It allows web servers to declare that web browsers or other complying user agents should automatically interact with it using only HTTPS connections, which provide transport layer security TLS, SSL, unlike the insecure HTTP used alone. HSTS is an IETF standards track protocol and is specified in RFC 6797. The HSTS policy is communicated by the server to the user agent via an HTTPS response header field named Strict Transport Security. One HSTS policy specifies a period of time during which the user agent should only access the server in a secure fashion. Two websites using HSTS often do not accept clear text HTTP, either by rejecting connections over HTTP or systematically redirecting users to HTTPS though this is not required by the specification. The consequence of this is that a user agent not capable of doing TLS will not be able to connect to the site. The protection only applies after a user has visited the site at least once, and the way this protection works is that a user entering or selecting a URL to the site that specifies HTTP will automatically upgrade to HTTPS without making an HTTP request, which prevents the HTTP man in the middle attack from occurring. Okay, so let's see what is man in middle attacks.
In cryptography and computer security, a man in the middle, monster in the middle, one, two, machine in the middle, monkey in the middle, three, mighty M, or person in the middle, four, PITM, attack is a cyberattack where the attacker secretly relays and possibly alters the communications between two parties who believe that they are directly communicating with each other. One example of a mighty M attack is active eavesdropping, in which the attacker makes independent connections with the victims and relays messages between them to make them believe they are talking directly to each other over a private connection, when in fact the entire conversation is controlled by the attacker. The attacker must be able to intercept all relevant messages passing between the two victims and inject new ones. This is straightforward in many circumstances, for example, an attacker within the reception range of an unencrypted Wi-Fi access point could insert themselves as a man in the middle, 5, 6, 7, as it aims to circumvent mutual authentication, a mighty M attack can succeed only when the attacker impersonates each endpoint sufficiently well to satisfy their expectations. Most cryptographic protocols include some form of endpoint authentication specifically to prevent mighty M attacks. For example, TLS can authenticate one or both parties using a mutually trusted certificate authority. In cryptography, a certificate authority or certification authority CA, is an entity that issues digital certificates. A digital certificate certifies the ownership of a public key by the named subject of the certificate. This allows others relying parties, to rely upon signatures or on assertions made about the private key that corresponds to the certified public key. A CA acts as a trusted third party, trusted both by the subject owner of the certificate and by the party relying upon the certificate. The format of these certificates is specified by the BI.509 or EMV standard. One particularly common use for certificate authorities is to sign certificates used in HTTPS, the secure browsing protocol for the World Wide Web. Another common use is in issuing identity cards by national governments for use in electronically signing documents. Okay, so you see, uh, my browser is checking that whether the certificate is valid or not. If it is not valid, uh, then it thinks that there is a, a man in middle uh, that is uh, intercepting my connection and prevents me to connect that website. So this is about what is about a uh, certificate and. Uh, uh, application you use to uh, connect over HTTPS, okay. Preventing SSL stripping with HSTS. Okay, so... When uh, H HSTS is enabled, uh, it prevents you from connecting over HTTP. Limitation of HSTS requires first visit to secure website to set HSTS policy in browser can be solved by browser having preloaded list of HSTS websites browsers would be vulnerable if attacker could delete HSTS cache. Okay. Phishing and failed authentication. Okay, so there is a phishing email coming from the um, hackers and masquerade, mas masquerading as bank. Masquerading as bank. When you click the phishing email link, you go to the fake bank page and they send a fake server certificate. Fake bank looks real and uh, then uh, you may be redirected to a fake login page and your credit answers may get stolen okay and ip layer security ipsic and virtual private networks okay so let's see the ip layer security IPSEC, Introduction 47, Internet Protocol Security IPSEC, is standard for secure communications over Internet Protocol IP, networks, through the use of cryptographic security services. 
uses encryption, authentication and key management algorithms, based on an end-to-end -end security model at the IP level, provides a security architecture for both IPv4 and IPv6 mandatory for IPv6 optional for IPv4 requires operating system support, not application support. Okay. So IP security is done at the layer 3 network layer or internet layer you see. IPSEC, Security Services 49, Message Confidentiality, protects against unauthorized data disclosure. Accomplished by the use of encryption mechanisms. Message integrity, IPSEC can determine if data has been changed intentionally or unintentionally during transit. Integrity of data can be assured by using a MAC. Traffic analysis protection, a person monitoring network traffic cannot know which parties are communicating, how often, or how much data is being sent. Provided by concealing IP datagram details such as source and destination address. Okay. So you see providing by concealing IP datagram details such as source and destination address. IPSEC, Security Services 50, Message Replay Protection, the same data is not delivered multiple times, and data is not delivered grossly out of order. However, IPSEC does not ensure that data is delivered in the exact order in which it is sent. Peer Authentication, each IPSEC endpoint confirms the identity of the other IPSEC endpoint with which it wishes to communicate. Ensures that network traffic is being sent from the expected host. Network access control, filtering can ensure users only have access to certain network resources and can only use certain types of network traffic. IPSEC, Common Architectures 51, Gateway to Gateway Architecture, Host to Gateway Architecture, Host to Host Architecture. Okay, IPSEC gateway architecture is like this. There is VPN gateway, internet VPN gateway. So, uh, your local network goes to the internet by VPN gateway. Okay. And host gateway is like this. There is host, which is, for example, my computer. I directly connect to the internet. However, when I con connect the uh, target network, I use a VPN gateway. And there is host host architecture which I directly connect to my host. IPSEC, Protocols Types 55, Encapsulating Security Payload, ESP, Confidentiality, Authentication, Integrity and Replay Protection, Authentication Header, A, uh, Authentication, Integrity and Replay Protection. However there is no confidentiality, Internet Key Exchange Ike, negotiate, create, and manage security associations, a connection consists of two SAW security associations, one SAW for each directions, each SAW is described by a set of parameters. Okay. IPSEC, modes of operation 56, each protocol ESP or A can operate in transport or tunnel mode. Transport mode operates primarily on the payload data of the original packet. Generally only used in host-to-host -host architectures. Tunnel mode, original packet encapsulated into a new one, payload is original packet. Typical use is gateway-to-gateway -gateway and host-to-gateway architectures. Okay, transport modes ESP, original packet IP header data, then uh, original packet is modified like this. There is ESP header, authenticated data, encrypted UC data is encrypted, and there is ESP authentication added to the end of the uh, packet. These are all related to network uh, delivery actually. And you see packets are modified to encrypt the data and additional packets uh, additional uh, data uh, is added to the packet of course for uh, transport mode uh, esp
IPSIC, ESP in transport mode, outbound packet processing 58, the data after the original IP header is padded by adding an ESP trailer and the result is then encrypted using the symmetric cipher and key in the SAW. An ESP header is prepended. If an SAW uses the authentication service, an ESP MAC is calculated over the data prepared so far and appended. The original IP header is prepended. However, some fields in the original IP header must be changed. For example, protocol field changes from TCP to especially. Total length field must be changed to reflect the addition of the AW header. Checksums must be recalculated. And there is tunnel mode ESP. And by the way, uh, uh... So ESP is encapsulating security payload, just to remember. And we have the original IP packet, then new IP header is added. Uh, so you see in the tunnel mode the IP header changes and on transport mode it doesn't change and then uh, ESP head, header added then IP header is here uh, it is encapsulated with uh, other data and ESP authentication is added so you see in tunnel mode the IP header is also encrypted unlike in the transport mode. Okay. IPSIC, ESP in tunnel mode, outbound packet processing 60, the entire original packet is padded by adding an ESP trailer and the result is then encrypted using the symmetric cipher and key agreed in the SAW. An ESP header is prepended. If an SAW uses the authentication service, an ESP MAC is calculated over the data prepared so far and appended. A new, outer, IP header is prepended. The inner, IP header of the original IP packet carries the ultimate source and destination addresses. The outer, IP header may contain distinct IP addresses such as addresses of security gateways. The outer, IP header protocol field is set to especially. Security Association 61, a security association SAW, contains info needed by an IPSC endpoint to support one end of an IPSC connection. Can include cryptographic keys and algorithms, key lifetimes, security parameter index SPI, and security protocol identifier ESP or AW. The SPI is included in the IPSC header to associate a packet with the appropriate SAW. Security associations are simplex, need one for each direction of connection, stored in a security association database SAD. Key exchange is largely automated after initial manual configuration by administrator prior to connection setup. CISAKMP, Ike, Oakley, Scheme and SAS. Key exchange, Alice and Bob have common, long-term, secret SDH exchange is authenticated, MyDM not possible, after each session, session key is destroyed, perfect forward secrecy. Typical usage of IPSC, VPN. So used the uh, typical usage is VPN, you have already uh, heard it probably. Uh, it is virtual private network. You see there is a protected pipe being generated between your client and destination and we will learn about it.
Risks of using IPSC for VPN 64, IPSC typically used for VPN virtual private networks, a VPN client at external location may be connected to the internet e.g. from hotel room or cafe while at the same time being connected to home network via VPN. VPN gives direct access to resources in home network. Internet access from external location may give high exposure to cyber threats, no network firewall, no network IDs, attacks against the VPN client at external location can directly access the home network through VPN tunnel. Okay. I will check something. IPSIC's protocol objective is to provide security services for IP packets such as encrypting sensitive data, authentication, protection against replay and data confidentiality. As outlined in our IPSIC protocol article, encapsulating security payload ESP and authentication header AW are the two IPSIC security protocols used to provide these security services. Analyzing the ESP and AWP protocols is out of this article's scope, however you can turn to our IPSC article where you'll find an in-depth analysis and packet diagrams to help make the concept clear. Okay, these are more related to uh, network. If you are wondering how they work, you can check them. I will add these to uh, our um, lecture slides. Okay, let's add a link. Risks of using IPSC for VPN 64, IPSC typically used for VPN virtual private networks, a VPN client at external location may be connected to the internet e.g. from hotel room or cafe while at the same time being connected to home network via VPN. VPN gives direct access. And we have read this. So the risk of using VPN attacker can uh use your uh client computer to directly connect your uh network home network okay 
I see. So this is the risk of using VPN. And you can use cloud VPN. Cloud VPN, a cloud-based infrastructure for VPN. AKA, hosted VPN, VPN AAS, virtual private network as a service, cloud VPNs provide security and globally accessible VPN service access without the need for any VPN infrastructure on the user's end. The user connects to the cloud VPN through the provider's website or a desktop mobile app. The pricing of cloud VPN is based on pay per usage or a flat fee subscription. Disadvantages, risks, clear text gap at the VPN provider, VPN provider knows internet usage profile, malicious VPN service. For example, uh, Kaspersky have a uh, cloud VPN, you see Kaspersky VPN, when I enable this, uh, from that moment, my connections will go to the uh, cloud VPN server and then go to the, its target and from its target it will come back to the cloud vpn server and from cloud vpn server it will come back to me so my service provider uh, my internet provider will not uh, see which websites i am visiting or will not be able to read its content if it is https they cannot already uh, see its content however they can see which websites you are visiting, even you are using HTTPS. Okay, so the cloud VPN is like this. You see from company branch A uh, with protected pipe, you go to the VPN, then it goes back to the branch B and it is being secured. And there is VPN browsing. User goes to the VPN server, then goes to the internet and there the message comes back and it goes back to the user and the famous tour the onion router an anonymizing routing protocol originally sponsored by the u.s naval research laboratory from 2004 to 2006 was supported by f since 2006 independent nonprofit organization creates a multi-hop proxy circuit through the internet from client to destination each hop wraps another encryption layer thereby hiding the next destination no clear text gap except at the exit node no node knows end-to-end -end client server association full technical details https colon slash slash www.torproject.org slash okay so what is clear text hmm. so you see only the exit node is vulnerable to be detected when you are using the uh, tor how it works uh, alice wants to connect alice tor client obtains a list of tor nodes from a directory server it is in her part let's say dave so these are the uh, tor nodes and other people then alice tor client picks a random path to destination server okay and green links are encrypted so at least connects to the first third server then the another third server and then the another third server and then it goes directly to the bulb which is the destination uh, path then step three if at later time the user visits another site Alice store client selects a se second random path. Again, green links are encrypted, red links are clear. Okay. So it is how it is going. Okay. So uh, for uh, internet service provider to track back to Alice uh, the connection or um, any party. They have to track back these uh, Tor nodes, which is impossible because they are already encrypted. They can only track back to the exiting uh, Tor node. So if you become a Tor node, uh, you may get in trouble seriously because if a crime gets done, uh, you will be the uh, exposed 
you may be the exposed third note. So you see this last one, the last note is the note which will be tracked back to the uh, this connection. Okay, so if this connection commits a crime, uh, it will be uh, tracked back to this exiting third note. Okay, not the previous ones. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let me show you the third note uh, risks. Okay, so Three, if you are only a Tor client, e.g. you're using Tor browser to browse the web, you are not an exit node, or any node at all, and you are fine. Nobody will be able to tell where your traffic is going, except of course the exit node. Granted, some exit nodes might do some shady things, so HTTPS over Tor is your best option for maximum security and privacy. If you're actively running a Tor node, i.e. you're listed as a possible route by the Tor directory authorities, that's different from just being a user. You can't be a node by accident, you have to set some stuff up. If you're not an exit node, then everything that goes through your server is encrypted, and no web service is going to know you were even involved. If you're an exit node, then web services know traffic is going through you. Then you could get into a little trouble. The most notable thing that will happen is that you will be deluged in DMCA notices. Fortunately, that's not your fault, and Tor prepared a response letter for you. Your ISP might not be alright with you running an exit node or any kind of proxy, and some might just disconnect you. There is a list of good and bad ISPs in this regard. Because of that, and because of warrant, seizure laws, running an exit node from your home computers is almost certainly a bad idea. You'll also run into legal problems if you snoop on the outgoing traffic, but hopefully you're a good guy and aren't doing that anyway. Further reading, legal FAQ for relay operators. In summary, bad things TM will probably only happen if you're explicitly set up as an exit node, and even so, you'll probably be alright if you take the appropriate precautions as outlined in Tor documentation. If you don't run an exit node, you're good. Okay, you see Tor project is blocked in my ISP, therefore I am not able to connect that website. Okay, uh, I think uh, uh, this is enough for today. Uh, um, this is about communication security always use HTTPS always make sure that your computer uh, is not uh, inflicted by some malware or some virus because if virus changes your root certificate uh, it may expose you to uh, communication attacks so the certificates are important use the updated browsers such as uh, google chrome or opera or uh, most recent internet explorer don't use unknown uh, browsers because browser is the thing that checks uh, your certificates or https uh, connection therefore your browser security is really important and okay okay hopefully see you next week uh end of end of lecture